Dugin was pretty close to a Nazi, to be honest, and his rhetoric about the Ukrainians um, as sort of subhumans and not really existing had real echoes of Nazi sort of exterminationist um, rhetoric towards Slavs and, and, and Jews and others. Now, it could be that the attack on Dugin um, will be seen as a validation of his thoughts and that Putin, you know, the authorities could project, project this as, you know, um, our patriotic thinkers are under attack and we have to push back. In terms of what we know about what happened, it's still incredibly murky. Yes, I think P Dugin himself was a very murky figure. He, I think it's a bit of a stretch to call him a philosopher. Um, he did have an academic position, although he lost that in slightly strange circumstances. And I think it's easy to overestimate his position inside Russia. What he was really good at was meeting with the far right abroad. So he would go to places like America and meet with the Ku Klux Klan. He would meet with um, right wing um, thinkers and ideologues in European countries and elsewhere in the world. And he would get quite a good audience there. He was a very sort of strange, impressive-looking figure with a long, wispy beard and spoke quite good English and had a sort of hypnotic presence. But I think to call him Putin's brain would be an insult both to brains and indeed even to Putin. And in fact, Mark Galliotti said it in the Sunday Times yesterday that uh, talks about the Dugan paradox. He is Schrodinger's uh, ideologist, uh, once important and also not. Yes, I think that what he did was to he brought the idea of Eurasianism, the, which is a slightly strange concept, but the idea that the sort of Eurasian landmass is what really matters, that Russia's at the heart of it, and that Russia should divide up influence on that land at landmass with other big um, powers, notably Germany. He brought that back into the political mainstream in the 1990s, at a time when Russian political discussion was much more uh, about democracy, human rights, make the country prosperous, and so on. So he he played a, a, a role in bringing these weird ideas from the 1930s and earlier back into modern Russia. And he but he didn't. I did, and he and he published a couple of books which which sold quite well. But I, as as I said, I think it would be an exaggeration to say that he mm. was. Um, he had, Smart Putin. Putin took advantage of the ideas that Putin had floated. I put it that that Dugin had floated. I put it that way around. But but, but even regardless of, of, of his importance, <coughs> excuse me, in Putin's ear, we've still got the situation where an, an ally of President Putin um, has had a very close uh, attempt on his life via a car bomb on the streets of Moscow. How important a, a shift is that? Is that much of a change from the Moscow we've seen of previous years? Well. I wrote in a piece yesterday that life was already cheap in, in Moscow and it just got a bit cheaper. Um, car bombs are quite unusual. There were more, more of them in the 1990s when I was a correspondent there. Um, but I think everybody in Russia's political and ideological elite will be looking around a bit nervously, as indeed will their immediate families, because whoever had reason to kill Dugin might well have reason to kill other people as well. You mentioned at the beginning, one theory is that this is a false flag, which will be a pretext for some kind of huge new crackdown. Well, that's always possible, but it's hard to falsify. I think that the denials from Ukraine are very credible, and it doesn't make sense if, if Ukraine was able to run hit squads in the heart of Moscow uh, and, and willing to kill people. I don't think Dugin would be top of their contact, their, their sort of target list. So I think it's more likely it's some sort of internal machination. That there is a claim of responsibility from a group we haven't um, heard of previously um, called, I think, the National Republican Army, which is some other sort of far-right group probably invented by the security services, and they may or may not have actually done it, and you know, one lives in this sort of hall of mirrors with um, claims and counterclaims. Um, but I think that the, the answer for this lies fundamentally in Moscow and in something probably deeply unpleasant and very worrying, which we are yet to, yet to find out the full details about. Can I, can I just go back to this, this ideology, this, this sense of uh, uh, Mother Russia, the Greater Russia, the combination of the Soviet Union and the old Russian Empire? Um, how, how widespread is this? Is this something which really resonates strongly with ordinary people in Russia? Yes, it's a very mixed ideology and it doesn't really stand up from the outside. It's a mixture of Soviet nostalgia 
and the idea that the Soviet Union was absolutely brilliant, as Putin once said, its collapse was the geopolitical catastrophe of the century. Then you've got Tsarist nostalgia, which is sort of older and deeper for the Russian Empire, and that brings in Russian orthodoxy, which of course suffered terribly under the Soviet Union. Um, then there's a kind of Russian fascism, which is much more ethnic-based, the idea that the Russian language is tremendous important Russian culture um, and the sort of more modern, modern um, form of Russian nationalism. And it doesn't really make sense when you stick it together, but it is always bad news for the neighbours. And the Eurasianist idea is, um, in a way, closer to the old Soviet ideology. It's about um, Russia as having a sort of huge civilizational mission for the whole world. That everybody should sit up and listen to Dugin and people like that, which clashes a bit with the sort of more narrow nationalist message, which is, yeah, Russia, Russia first and the rest of the world can get a hang. So aside from um, any questions of, of who might be responsible for this and why, that nostal not that nostalgia, that, that fascism that you describe, which sort of Dugan aspired, which many people in Russia sympathised with, is definitely under attack with this attempt on his life. And that is something that President Putin will be able to capitalise on publicly and maybe get back on side any Russians who are feeling slightly war-weary about what's happening in Ukraine. Yes. I mean, I mean, Dukin was pretty close to a Nazi, to be honest, and his rhetoric about the Ukrainians um, as sort of subhumans and not really existing had real echoes of Nazi sort of exterminationist um, rhetoric towards Slavs and, and, and Jews and others. Now, it could be that the attack on Dugin um, will be seen as a validation of his thoughts and that Putin, you know, the authorities could project, project this as, you know, um, our patriotic thinkers are under attack and we have to push back that could be it it could be a warning to the far right saying don't criticize putin because there are people on the on the russian far right who say that putin isn't nearly tough enough and there's a particularly um, a, a leader of the um russian backed separatist uh, groups in the um donbass gherkin igor gherkin who's been vigorously criticizing the russians for the way the russian authorities mm. for the way that wage war and actually praising, although I hate Zelensky, he's been much better leader than Putin. So it could be that Putin and, and the authorities need to yeah. do some tidying up on the far right. But at this stage, I, I'm rather cautious about speculating because in a way, um, we're falling into the trap. The real hostage and you know, victims here are the Ukrainians. And that's the, you know, we should mm. be keeping them front and centre of our mind rather than worrying about the ebb and flow of um, murky politics in the sort of backwaters of Moscow. Yeah. 